Welcome to another Wrestling Roundtable discussion. I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, joined by the Dudley Boys of What Culture, Michael Hamplett and Michael Sidgwick, here to discuss, unbelievably, Cody Rhodes' impending WWE arrival. It has been a wild week, Sidg, but let's start before we predict what he could end up doing back in the Fed with your reaction to the news when it broke on Tuesday. I was completely stunned. Completely stunned. I know that being reports and you know the old adage there's no smoke smoke without fire and all the rest of it but i just thought it was more cody verse stuff um he'd said in an interview or a webcam thing or whatever that he was taking everyone on a strange journey the likes of which we've never been on before and the man was goddamn right if nothing else but i thought he was <laughs> talking about that in the parameters of AEW storyline. I mean, it's incredible for all the reasons that have been documented at this point. The guy obviously was an EVP, he was integral to the launch of AEW and the movement that made it possible in the first place. He's an EVP. Um, I know his responsibilities within that role had diminished, but he's still known in shorthand as an EVP, as an incredibly high up management figure in that company. Um, there's lots of things to discuss in terms of the permutations of his departure and all the rest of it. So I don't want to be too scatterbrained. Um, but yeah, my initial reaction was total shock. I could not believe it at all. I'm still unconvinced it's the best career decision. I think Cody really wanted a day like Tuesday. He's always like an incredibly impulsive guy. Um, everything he feels on that day, he feels very intensely about, and then maybe he forgets about. I think a part of him just wanted to set the world on fire and have that Tuesday happen where he dislodged Steve Austin's in-ring return from the news cycle where everything was about Cody, one of the most seismic news stories of the year, the decade, potentially even the century, if you think of the ramifications of it all. Has he thought beyond this Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> now that it's, what, Thursday time of recording? Has the reality set in? Um, I'm not convinced. Um, ultimately, the guy created an incredible legacy in all elite wrestling. Um, I hope his contribution is remembered for more than just a bet he made with Dave Meltzer and a romantic story about the rise of an alternative. But... The last thought I want to give before we talk about all things WWE is that the news and, in fact, his decision is a sobering reminder of what professional wrestling actually is. It's a platform on which to make your money. And in retrospect, it does kind of taint. And you know what? You can't be naive about this. You can't not respect his decision. But in retrospect, it does kind of heard the rhetoric about Ellis Island. He himself called AEW that, and how much does creative freedom matter and a wrestling company run by wrestlers matter? It's all a bit bittersweet in retrospect, that, but you know what? It is now, but in like two or three years' time, all of that will have softened, all of those raw feelings about what you're meant to think of a wrestler or is AEW just the nice promised land where the embittered wrestlers go or is it just another place to make money before you make more money somewhere yeah. else? Um yeah, just totally stunned. We could talk about this for hours. Mm. That's how fascinating the story is and how layered it is, but I will let my esteemed colleague have a word in. Yeah, Hamflick, could you have ever seen this coming? No, and I don't think anybody else would have, like, honestly and earnestly predicted that. Certainly no earlier than December or whenever it was when the first whispers of he hadn't signed. But every single story was he hasn't signed, but everybody assumes yeah. it will come. I was in the, I guess, unfortunate position of writing up the story of he hasn't yet signed. And even then, it was news, and you don't pepper it with too many of your opinions, but it was little phrases like, you know, in the unlikely event he wasn't to re-sign, things like that. But you were you were saying it because it just you felt like it had to be said for a little bit of balance, not that you actually thought it would occur. Um, I was sort of ghoulishly excited with the news. Cedric says about just setting fire to everything. I couldn't get enough of watching the flames. If anything, and this is not to be too harsh on Cody, but it was nice to see him set fire to something that I kind of wanted to watch burn rather than his some back. of the, rather than some of it, rather than his back or some of the AW storylines that he was maybe doing it as part of the Cody verse that kind of summed up his last year on screen. Um, this was this was sort of damage free. There were no storylines or pushes or anything like that that could potentially be harmed slightly by his slightly wayward decision making. This was just going to be chaos. And what we've all learned over the years, I would say, especially over the last five years, um, it used to be never say never. Eric Bischoff goes to Monday Night Raw and we all stay never say never. And that's it. That's the end of it. That's advanced now. It's not only like never say never, start saying Ever. You know, start imagining the possibilities of these things happening and then every now and then they come up and we get to them one day. The point about Steve Austin getting knocked off the front page that Cedric made, 
is so powerful for more than just that Cody's done it, that an AEW story in general or an mm -hmm. AEW adjacent yeah. story can now dominate the landscape as a result of Cody's contributions and as a result of AEW's growth in this, you know, in this little sort of corner of, you know, the hobbyist culture that is pro wrestling. So all of it, I was just endlessly, endlessly fascinated by all of it. It's cool that we kind of get to do this, what is now currently speculation as Cody enjoys this period of radio silence and probably gets to look upon it and enjoy all the takes, the ones that are maybe close to it and the ones that are a million miles away, <laughs> I imagine he gets equal enjoyment out of. And indeed, analyzing over the months and years to come, the macro and micro ramifications of it. It's an awesome story. It's made real the daft patter we were able to have that Tony Khan might bring in Shane McMahon for the crack a couple of weeks mm. ago. That then was a, a bit of fun. Let's be realistic. This is the closest to the realistic manifestation of that the other way. Yeah, it's, it's a wild time. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, it's, like I say, sort of impending WWE arrival, one would assume. All the reports seem to point to you know Vince McMahon having big plans for him. Um, and, and as Sid alluded to, you know, money is talked and he's returning to WWE. What do you think we should expect? And when should we expect it? I mean, could he could he show up at the Elimination Chamber this weekend? Could he show up on the, the Raw after the Chamber? Could he show up on SmackDown to interrupt Roman Reigns? What, what are you thinking right now? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> and that's what's extra thrilling about this news is that it's happened at no better time for WWE. There would be people that would argue that this could have been perfect for WWE in something like a September. Typically when there's that like desperate post-SummerSlam fall-off or even post-WrestleMania, this kind of period where they need a big story. Nah, WWE center everything around WrestleMania now. They pretty much have booked next year's WrestleMania main events because they're not able to think of 10 matches for a few weeks of television, but they'll think of two for a pay-per-view 13 months from now. <laughs> So Cody coming in right now is when they're, I don't want to say fine-tuned, but they're most attuned to what's happening in wrestling. They're booking big events. They're trying to sell lots of tickets and lots of things. You know, they're going to be, they get to be the center of the wrestling universe for approximately two or three days a year now, and that's WrestleMania weekend. So Cody being here, whether it be because they're in Saudi Arabia, whether it be because we're on the road to WrestleMania, just only adds to this, to the to the chaos and the carnage of the story. Um, yes, they could fly it. Like, and let's talk about this very briefly. There's no non-compete. So we're saying all this, not wildly speculating, but dealing with the facts in front of us. Yes, he could be on a plane as we are sitting here talking to Saudi Arabia to debut to set up a WrestleMania program. Yes, he could have lined up his first three or four SmackDown appearances and what he was going to do. The first um, sort of news broke from, and I can't remember the source, and I apologize that um, he was expected at the Performance Center. I think it was. And what exactly that entails, nobody knows yet. And not knowing only makes this more fun because the mere fact that Cody has moved means that you can't close any doors on anything. And Cody himself will surely know that. That will have been part of the conversation. There was a, from the very early days that he would have entertained the prospect of going back to WWE. It's interesting to think about what power he wants to potentially yield. And subsequently, like every creative, at least for the first month, let's say, every creative decision that you have to imagine is going to want a very firm hand on. Uh, Sige, when it comes to what they've got planned for him, you also had this idea of, of having a bit of fun with it to start with. It'd be so very WWE if they <laughs> don't extract every last opportunity from this incredible story in what, quite frankly, is an incredible coup. It's the first major, with all due respect to but Blair Davenport, mm. Like, people can barely remember her new name, and she wasn't a huge star to begin with, at least in the... I keep talking about this NXT UK. Uh, I have no that? idea what this is. It's something to do with progress Why did they put something. UK on the end of the 2.0 show? I, 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 don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't know. But ultimately, this is a huge opportunity. WWE has got this tendency, and you might agree with it if you really like WWE, and you might disagree. I mean, you might disagree if you really like WWE and you'd be wrong. They've got this incredible tendency to make guys just feel like guys. Just spokes on the wheel. Those are not my words. Those are the words of CM Punk. And he's right. They've got this horrible, for a wrestling promotion, I say this all of the time, promotion is the key goddamn word in what this is meant to be. They don't promote anyone. They just put them out there in meaningless storylines that are often retconned within a week. They're often just traded wins back and forward in a week. People just become people. Wrestlers, stars are just bodies. Cody Rhodes isn't that. 
Cody Rhodes is a huge deal, especially in this context. It is mad how mad all of this is. Have some goddamn fun with it. Do not, please, put him out there. Cut some kind of promo and have him get interrupted. Have some fucking fun with it, for God's sake. The last big major company signed someone, with all due respect to Brian Danielson, who I think is the best wrestler alive currently working. It's CM Punk, obviously. AEW had a tremendous amount of fun with that. They created this ingenious viral marketing campaign. They sold a ticket. They sold, sorry, 20,000 tickets to the United Center in Chicago and preserved the, is he actually going to be yeah. here pop at the same time? They had their cake. They ate it too. They had all the fun. They fostered all of this incredibly nerdy, but still awesome fantasy booking. They had 20,000 ice everyone. creams and everybody ate them too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why can't WWE do this? I know the answer. They're incompetent. They are boring. <laughs> Have some fun with it. Just one idea I've plucked out of my arse. Please run a Stardust vignette. Or not an actual vignette where you put the guy in face paint. But you know the old, diddly, like the, you know the, the music. Yeah. You can hear yeah. it in your head. The font. Just run that for 10 seconds on a pre-recorded SmackDown because you can actually do that. Just add it into the goddamn broadcast, which is taped and ready to press play on. Add that in. People will go crazy for that. Do it more. Just do... That's just out of my arse. Do more and more things with it. Someone with a bag on their head at ringside. Yes, absolutely. People love the sting from the Smoke and Mirror song. Whoa! Like that noise that's somewhere yeah. appearing on the broadcast. Yeah. Those things actually meant stuff. From Cody's, which, you know, a run that he was has been so critical of, and, you know, for reasons both political and otherwise, it's been worth him being critical of those runs over the years. There's an affection... Oh, yeah. For all of them, from some section of the fan base. Great moustache, some... a very inspirational <laughs> moustache to some people. Like, if they do the broadest clay route with this, it could be phenomenal. Yeah. Like, slowly tease the idea of Stardust coming back, and there will be people out there daft enough, right, to say, oh, you know, Stardust was great all along, all the people who hate AEW, <laughs> and what, like, <laughs> WWE can just be seen as better at all costs. Oh, I, I really like Stardust, actually. And then, on the other hand, because some AEW fans are nuts as well, they could say, ah, they're tearing them into Stardust. Yeah. People will believe it. Other people will be aware of the fact that clearly he's not going to be Stardust. And then, like, it'll just create all sorts of conversations. And that's literally one idea they could do. They could have so much fun with it. Before I get your uh, predictions in terms of where and when and how and you think he's going to show up, there's been one question that has been quite a perm a permanent in terms of our responses on the news for Twitter questions. And it's the panic, not about him being stardust or them just normalizing him, about polka dots. They couldn't, could they? Or I suppose they could introduce you know an element of that into the fun of, of teasing Cody. I would frankly be amazed if within the first three months of Cody being in WWE, if he is indeed wearing his suit that we've become familiar with now, he's not wearing like a polka dotted tie or polka dotted pocket square or something. And it's something he takes a bit of ownership of. Mm. He did as Stardust, if you remember that WrestleMania when he got the put. It's almost like he felt like he had to take a bit of control of that. It was just after Dusty died and it was like, right, time to time to babyface what this represented about Dusty Rhodes' legacy rather than the thing that Vince McMahon was doing to take the mick out of his father, you know? So I would be amazed if there, that isn't done in the nicest of possible ways, even if they try to impose things upon him. Ultimately, long term, they will impose things upon him and there might come a time where he wishes it was just polka dots. Because one of these days, they might impose a 15-minute show opening Monday Night Raw. Welcome to Monday Night Raw promo on him. Polka Dots are much better than yes. one of those. And But he's signing on for that. You know, I'm not saying that in a, how could you, WWE? No, that's how could you, Cody, if you weren't expecting that. That's a reality of going back into that system. The system that he railed against, the system that he felt oppressed by, is the one that he's walking back into. Nobody, everyone gets versions of control, but nobody gets absolute power. And Cody will be no different in that. So I think he can, we've said this quite a bit already on this podcast, um, and normally we would criticize people. We just love to have fun. But I think Cody can have some fun with a number of elements of his past within WWE, of the person that... The wrestling public knows him as now versus what they once knew him as, as a former EVP, as a guy that can almost, and he's going to have to, at some point or other, cast a sideways glance on AEW. That's going to be a hard pill for a lot of wrestling fans to swallow. I think AEW fans specifically, it's going to be rough the first time that he even has to, in passing, mention an opponent, maybe unfavorably, or an experience from AEW unfavorably, because for so long it was seen as wrestling's milk and honey, wrestling's Ellis Island, and at some point or another, and Cody's got a bit of a... He likes those little 
wry glances every now and then. He like he's got a bit of the devil in him sometimes, and he I think sometimes he quite enjoys him and he thinks if I can walk the margins here, people online are going to think, "How dare you do that to my Cody?" And he's going to enjoy watching that reaction. All of this, polka dots and beyond, is there to be, have fun with. I've thought of the idea of um, having the stage set up as normal, but everyone comes out in the middle in WWE, don't they? Put a door on the right-hand side of the stage <laughs> and slap a Forbidden logo on it. Brilliant. And have him walk through that because here he comes through the side rather than the middle. The, like There's all sorts of ways that he can almost gently needle AEW because it's all about making money. And if you don't believe it's all about making money, listen to every other element of this podcast, this conversation. Yes. Why is he moved? Listen you know? to the title. Yeah. Read the title of the goddamn podcast. They don't have fun. <laughs> is my problem here. Like, Vince McMahon's got a maxim. Never tease a match, right, that you don't intend to actually deliver. He was furious with CM Punk and Steve Austin for kind of working mm. that angle once it's upon a time. It's good practice. It's good practice. But at the same time, like, if you're going to deliver it eventually, what difference does it make? Mm. MGF dropped a reference to CM Punk before CM Punk debuted, and fans were prepared because they trust the process and they're not idiots to realistically go, well, we're not getting that yet, but that's something to look forward to. Seth Rollins willingly looks like an arsehole on national television, I mean, I'm not just, that's his gimmick. Can he not wear polka dots on Monday Night Raw when he opens a promo? Just mm. like in a stupid suit jacket with polka dots on, even if that's not necessarily his mm. first program. Just li- just tease us. Make us think of, oh, it's going to be Cody versus Seth Rollins at WrestleMania then. Just have some fun with it. Have some imagination with it. Make this, f- drag out this incredible story. Milk it for as long as goddamn possible. Well, you mentioned his first feud there. Who do you think it's going to be? Who, do you, who would you like it to be? Oh, I've got no idea. Out. Give me anything Cody Rhodes related in WWE. I cannot wait for this. This is the kind of thing wrestling has missed for 20 years. And as awesome as it was to see it actually happening happening in AEW, it was all very one-sided to the point where people started to take the piss out of how many free agent signings we're getting. And I, I wouldn't say the... De- Returns diminished. We had CM Punk long after Andrade, for example, who didn't have the best debut. But it was getting a bit like a novelty was wearing thin slightly. Like the magic of a John Moxley, you're not going to replicate that. CM Punk, Danielson, like everything is going to feel somewhat diminished in response to that. The fact that it's happening again is incredible. So I don't care what happens. When Cody Rhodes first appears on WWE television, I'm going to be electrified. Not only because it's just the image is he going to be where you'll have latitude over what he does you will have the randy orton schedule i imagine you will have certain perks kevin owens is allowed to kind of riff on the material he's given he will absolutely be allowed to do that within reason but like is it going to be weird watching cody rhodes on tv with like just a t-shirt on cutting a promo like would he be allowed to wear a suit seth rollins is allowed to wear his own stuff and not necessarily flog his t-shirts i'm just fascinated by all of this um i'm so interested I, I, rather than the first opponent, because I'm not being funny, within four months he'll work a very respectable, solid to very good series with Randy Orton. And it's like, this is strictly good. I cannot wait for turn three quarters of Damien Priest. What a strange week that's going to be. Yeah. Like, that's going to happen. Like, these gonna things so are going to happen. It's just the way they book. It's not going to be AEW's Cody in WWE. Mm-hmm. It's going to be WWE's Cody. And at some point, I'm sorry, if trends continue that they have been for the last however many years, that's what it's going to be. Uh, there's several matches that I think could be great. Like, WWE's roster is incredible. I'm just most so looking forward to what on earth he's going to say and how on earth he's going to spin it. The man, and I'm a big, huge fan of his, has spent the last three years, at a minimum, ripping the piss out of WWE. He's going to have no credibility with this audience. He's obviously going to get a massive reaction, a babyface reaction. A lot of the WWE fans will enjoy the novelty of another new star coming back from AEW. The fact that he's signed on the dotted line will instantly lionize him as a babyface because he's turned his back on AEW. But what can he, what can he possibly say that's going to have any credibility if, in fact, he returns as a babyface, which he almost kind of has to, given that he's the great defector? What can he say? that has any credibility to it whatsoever about wanting to join WWE. Hey guys, good roads here. They're paying me so much money and I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> what can he say? I cannot wait for his first promo. I'm honestly on the edge of my seat for it. When it comes to his first feud, there was a few things I was thinking of. There was people I would not like to see him face, <clears throat> which is an unlike a very WWE mindset. Like Orton, he's got a lot of history with, but I, I don't want that to be his first feud going into WrestleMania. 
Um, and then I look at the rest and I go, maybe it's someone like a Seth Rollins because his card's kind of free for WrestleMania. You know, a lot of other people, even like people like Kevin Owens now, you're like, oh, well, him in Austin and you've got the world titles and stuff. I think also you need to take a step back and go, signing someone like Cody Rose flips potentially the whole WrestleMania card on its head. So when we talk of WrestleMania and Cody Rhodes, it brings into sharp focus how few stars there are in WWE because Cody Rhodes versus anybody, 48 hours ago, Cody Rhodes versus anybody was nothing more than a dream match graphic. Now it's a potential reality for WrestleMania. But there are so few people that you see in the spot and then feel like livened by this. Seth Rollins is a potentially great match. I saw the Rhodes Brothers versus The Shield on a house show once, and it's one of the best house show matches I've ever seen. And I'm sure Cody and Seth would love to do their best bits in a modernized version of them. And now they've both become kind of made mm. men in pro wrestling. Um, there's loads of those great matches, tons of them. Cody has advanced way beyond the three-star Cody years. He became a carry artist. He became a fully-fledged main event star, knows how to get pretty much anything over. So he's got a roster of new wrestlers to face. He's got wrestlers who he's faced before that offer a completely different narrative. I'm not wild on the Orton thing. I mean, if they can't get Ted DiBiase back to get the band back together, what's been the point of any of this? But like, but the point remains that it's Cody Rhodes versus Randy Orton in an entirely different context. And it's it's new. Like, what's what's old isn't actually old. It is genuinely new because mm -hmm. of the Cody Rhodes that is returning. It's... Austin is an interesting one because imagine if Austin had had two WWE runs and the first run was the ringmaster for like five years and the second one was Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's what you've got with Cody effectively in terms of magnitude of star power. Oh, yeah. So that's who you're bringing back this time around. But on the opposite side of him, there's not many big deals. It is far easier mentally, I think, to explode the planned WrestleMania main event and put, for example, Brock Lesnar with Steve Austin and do Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes because it's easier in my mind to, from a perception point of view, to have Cody come in and cut that promo where once he's had his bit of fun saying, look, I'm here because I know who I am now and who I am is somebody that can go head to head with the head of the table. I was the head of the table and daddy still eats first. Something along those lines and then you've got Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns. It's unlikely because it's been, you know, Reigns and Lesnar, Lesnar's a Vince guy, Roman's a Vince guy, Cody's a God knows what guy. It's on Cedric's point about credibility as well, by the way, and I think this is going to be so interesting to watch. We're going to have to judge like the micro expressions and the little turns of phrases that Cody chooses. I don't want to be Bart Simpson that never had faith in Sideshow Bob or that one little boy all along. But my issues with Cody when he was doing the Ellis Island stuff in 2019 wasn't, I didn't, I, I did believe that he felt it. But my thing was the comparisons to Jeff Jarrett and Triple H were in bad faith when it came to him winning matches. I believed them when it came to, there are some wrestlers that want to be the best wrestlers. There are some wrestlers that want to be office. And it something jarred with me that I thought, Cody wants to be office. And he's telling me that he wants to be a revolutionary pro wrestler for the good guys. And I was like, no, I don't think I see that. If he does want to be office, and I believe that to be true, his dad was office. He's gone on record as saying, people aren't going to like me saying this, but I really respect Triple H. I watched what he did. And I want to be that guy. He's got a, for the want of a better phrase, play the game. So some things he's going to have to do because it's maybe about getting in Vince's good graces. Maybe it's about getting on that top table, you know? Maybe he's thinking, I'll take that Conrad pon podcast and I'll talk AEW on a Conrad podcast. All them sort of things. And at the same time, he wants to wrestle. He wants to prove himself. And he said he wants to be WWE champion. Like, you know, you can read that quote in a tremendous book by Michael Sidgwick available on Amazon that despite all of the AEW stuff... WWE title means something to him. So he's got to juggle those two things at the same time in the way that a Triple H did. If you don't do him versus Roman, like you say, as a big title match at WrestleMania, we've been sat here for a while talking about the fact that if it's not Brock or The Rock down the line, there's no one there that WWE have established as on Roman Reigns' level. If they don't do a WrestleMania, he could easily be the guy further down the line, let's just say at SummerSlam, that finally is perceived by fans as on Roma's level and can take that universal championship and, and become world champion. But the, the story's the best. This story is the goddamn best. When the novelty wears off, when the spite wears off, if we've got one over these young dickhead company who've got Billy Big Bollocks and they're all talk, those pissants, we've got Cody back. What an absolute flex that is. All feelings go away in the end, right? It's wrestling. It's a business. Vince McMahon is notoriously erratic. At some point, he's going to go, well, I made Roman. I didn't make you. 
I think I like Roman more because I like making my own guys. Will Cody at SummerSlam want to do the job to Roman Reigns? Well, it's fast. It's, wrestling's back. Will this is proper wrestling? Yeah. It's back. It is like they, Will Cody. Again, I'm not casting aspersions either way because it's a business. It's always worth remembering that these people should go in. To, it's why Kevin Nash is the best of all of us. Get in, make as much as you can. Get out, get your health intact. Ideally, Took long as well. enough. <laughs> yeah, like you know, ideally come out with your health intact. Go and make all the money. Don't resent wrestlers for like chasing the best deals they can get. Is Cody the guy? And I, I'm asking this question because I don't know. Is Cody the guy that wants to do this to do this because he thinks he can? because he believes in himself. He's betting on himself yet again, as he bet on himself the last time in leaving, to win the WWE title, to somehow... This is a bigger risk as well. Yeah, to somehow win Vincent Mann's favour over the likes of a Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar, despite just being Cody Rhodes. Like, is that what he's betting on himself? To then go back to AEW and have those matches that were left on the table. Matches which, by the way, he built up in his last ever promo in AEW. The likes of which with CM Punk, gone now. Like, he's got to go back and do that again. Or, and I don't know how much AEW hardcores want to think about this, is he a guy that once he's settled in WWE and maybe thinks, yeah, I quite like it here again, is on the phone to some old friends? And mm. how's it going for you there, Ricky Starks? You know, how's it going for you there, Red Velvet? Because there's some opportunities coming up and I can open some dot. Like, who knows? I, like, I, I'm not speculating either way and I don't think one way is good and one way is evil particularly, but I don't think you can rule any of that sort of stuff mm. out. It could go any which way over the next few years. Before I push both of you for... <clears throat> when he arrives and who he faces at WrestleMania. There's the question of Brandy Rhodes. Does she come with him to WWE? I don't know. It's not really been mooted. Maybe at some point. I've got no idea. It feels like a personal decision that I don't really want to speculate on. Um, so I won't. She's a brilliant part of his act. I don't mean to marginalise her skills as a wrestler or what she has offered. What we've Certainly what we've heard in the last few days, particularly what she's set up behind the scenes in AEW. But the Cody and Brandy act was tremendous. Um, if you go and watch Cody in a period where he would occasionally get raves, but more often than not, they would be like, ah, he's never going to be the main eventer he thinks he is in his New Japan run. Brandy was an awesome addition to his act as a valet. Very much like cut from the old cloth, to be honest, like running interference, causing problems, causing distractions, able to get physical if she needed. A huge, huge asset that obviously she never was when it was Stardust getting interviewed by Eden Styles. You know, so it's like, again, completely different like playing field now. So it's there... She's there as part of an act. Perhaps she would want to wrestle. As Cedric says, it's it's just not out there at the moment, yeah, so yeah. we don't know. But I would well put it like this: I would welcome it in the way that I would welcome, um, as a like for like comparison, I guess, the signing of Lana by AEW because Mira and Lana were cool. You know, for nothing more than that, acts are great, and people make other people better. Maurice makes them as better. You know, all the time when she's there. So for that reason, I would hope, yes, that she is in for that purpose at least. Right then, I'm going to push you on this. Uh, when he returns and who he faces at WrestleMania 30, if you believe he's going to have a match there. I'll certainly have a match there. Absolutely certainly have a match at WrestleMania 38. Just absolutely because this news makes you allowed to dream again. Does he... Because he's a baby face, but you can't have any credibility because he spent like the he has spent the last three and it's work he's working. Maybe he's never really felt all along, but he's been working people into thinking, I hate WWE, the old establishment, it's rubbish. Everyone kind of knew it was rubbish inside the industry. They need an alternative, and he goddamn helped make it. He also has to be a baby face because he's like the returning novelty star. But what stories are there to tell other than I'm coming from AEW? That's the big pull. It's not just Cody Rhodes to start. It's where he's come from. That kind of has to be factored into it in some way. But you can't necessarily come out and say, oh, I hated it there all along. It's like, well, that's bollocks. You've got no credibility. Genuinely, you could NWO this. You could genuinely NWO this in some way by saying that Cody Rhodes loved his time in AEW. He's just coming here to make some money, and then maybe I'll go back to that other place. Who is synonymous with... Standing up for WWE, Seth Rollins, <laughs> and when you look at who Cody could face, right, it's a damning picture of WWE. That's disposable. That's completely disposable. That character could change babyface, and nothing would be lost. Nothing of importance would be lost. With the drip gourd, <laughs> with, if that got <laughs> lost and canned, and Seth Rollins was like, right, I hate the fact that this kid's come back after everything he said about me and each and every one of you. 
I'll take out this the jack that looked like a dickhead. I'll get my chest out. And he can turn baby face. Oh, the drip god. Uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Seth Rollins playing E-drone defense squad <laughs> <laughs> against this cock end Cody Rhodes who's come from this place that he built on sacred ground on the WWE's world, right? And then they can have the match where Cody's essentially playing the Outsiders in 1996 versus stand-up for WWE Seth Rollins because I cannot fathom again this point. He can have no credibility as a babyface in this company. They are going to have to write the promo of all promos and he'll write about eight of them and do it in one promo length <laughs> talk. But I think NWO Outsiders Cody Rhodes versus stand-up for WWE Seth Rollins is the story. Hamlet, your prediction on the roads to WrestleMania? Oh, my word. Similar pitch, different man. Um... <laughs> I've got Rhodes coming back on a Raw or a SmackDown. It's probably going to be SmackDown, SmackDown isn't it? Yeah. You know, That's but like something where they're looking for buzz, something where they're looking for a number, the best. And Raw, in a way, makes more sense because they can donate more time to a promo, donate more time to flex in that they've got him. Have you seen how long Roman takes to get to the, to the ring? They've this got plenty true. of time on SmackDown. This is true. So, yeah, Raw, SmackDown, but most likely SmackDown to ultimately just say I'm here, but over as long as they can drag out and over as many, um, whether it be a live in-ring interview followed by sit-down interviews followed by whatever, whatever, as much as they can drag out of Cody being back and what that means. Well, is this going to be where they break from the norm and allow him to reference AW by name, you know, they're still going to stick with that other place because it's never going to sound more insincere than it's coming from. I think like trademark stuff as well. Yeah, it's like, so how they juggle that, but it's, it's again, I'm going to sort of evoke Eric Bischoff here. You think about him coming out on Monday Night Raw and then cutting a long promo because you do want to hear him, you want to look at this visual. But the WrestleMania season comparison I'm going to make for entirely different reasons was um, the wonderful news of when Roman Reigns was in remission, y'all, and he made his return and immediately everybody just assumed, oh, right, main event, Roman's back. And Vince was like, not right now. I've got my plans in place and I'm going to keep them in place and do the Shield stuff for the novelty Shield stuff. And then it's Drew McIntyre, very much in the mid card. Identical storyline to Sidgwick. The match isn't exciting. It goes eight minutes, but it looks amazing. They get to do all the flex stuff and it's against the Miz. It's a very similar stand-up for WWE guy. You know exactly what you're going to get. They're best mates anyway. So the Miz is going to be over the moon to have this. Like the Miz is... It's one of the reasons I love him. Like, he, he appeals to my driest sensibilities in that, like, he's such a safe pair of hands that the likes of your CM Punks and John Cena almost resent him a little bit for it. There's almost a, a vein of insecurity around someone like The Miz that just seems to have mastered it in a way that hasn't lost him respect amongst people, you know, especially because he had to survive the bullies of the locker room, your, your Hollies and your Undertakers and the like. So, yeah, I just think Cody and The Miz in something that might al three. <laughs> already sounds unremarkable. Like, and I apologize for that, but it just doesn't feel like he comes in and he blows everything up in the way that, like to us, to people that are outside of Vince McMahon's bubble, it makes all the sense to blow some stuff up because Cody Rhodes is here. To Vince McMahon, he didn't blow things up for Roman Reigns. So is he really going to yeah. do that? Is he really going to do that for Cody Rhodes right now when there's, as you say, it's SummerSlam to come, you know, when there's the battle for brand supremacy? So no, when there's next year's WrestleMania, when there's the Royal Rumble, et cetera, et cetera, you can get especially if there is an Austin, especially if there is a, um, a Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair and a, a Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns, Vincent Mann will be over the moon to have got the, the coup of AEW's short lifespan and be able to drop it in the mid-card as an unexpected WrestleMania attraction. I mean, like, I just can't wait to see whatever he does. The Rollins thing for me, if they want to take away any AEW overt references and weave it in the storylines, they could very simply say, like, yeah, I've talk some stuff over how many years, even if you don't want to address the elephant in the room, the only way I could possibly see it going is like, if he says something the effect of everyone knows who I am and why I'm here, again, have fun with it. <laughs> More cute references. I like them. I went away. Everyone knows what I did. And I went away for one purpose, and that is to prove I'm the biggest star in the world. Unfortunately, in my absence... Roman Reigns became the biggest star in the world, and I can't have that, and I'm here because that's the one person. He is the one in WWE. That means I can't say that I'm the most important wrestling figure of the century or whatever, and then they have that match. 
It's going to be absolutely fascinating. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts, of course. Plus, you can let us know your thoughts on Twitter at What Culture WWE. Watch there for all, all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflit at Michael Hamflit. Follow Michael Sidgwick at M. Sidgwick. Follow me at Adam Wilborn. Follow us all at What Culture <laughs> WWE, as I said. But for now, this has been a get the table discussion of Cody Rhodes' WWE debut and what to expect. My thanks. Thanks to the Dudley Boys. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you soon.